before. Hey, and welcome to today's class. Glad that you tuned in, folks. Welcome to our students, our VIP customers, our virtual in-person. We know you want to be here, really, but I'm sure you're still in your jammies sipping coffee. But anyway, uh, today's garden class is the first one of the summer series. So we'll go every Saturday at 930, now through, I think, October. Is, is the class series. It'll be irrigation of bugs and trees and heat loving and fruit trees. And we'll just change it out. We'll have different speakers. So this is the first class. This is kind of a technical class. Uh, it's more on bugs, weeds, that kind of stuff. And it's the doctors in the house. Just all day long, we seem to answer a lot of questions on, is this a problem? Do I need to worry? What do I do? Why did it do this on plants? And so that's kind of the class today. And then we'll, just so it's not all death and decay, we'll show off some, some pretty stuff too, some new things that, that are, there's a whole summer series of plants that are showing up at the garden center now. The spring things are starting to fade out. So we're down to our last forsythia. There might be a lilac left, but there's lots of Rosa Sharon's and Crete Myrtles. In the summer, there's things that just love the heat and they prefer being planted in the heat. The problem with the heat you'll find is everything grows fast including your diseases, including your, your uh, insects. So you got to really watch things. They'll go from, oh, that's not so bad, to the next weekend, there's nothing left just like that. And if you're in a greenhouse, oh, we love folks that bring their own chairs. Welcome. Well, well done. So uh, did you bring me a, a donut or something? Because I that you'd really be the man. <laughs> Welcome. Glad you're here. So anyway, uh, Everything grows really fast right now. So you really want to get on to stuff fast. Don't, don't wait or it can take over. So we're starting to see spider mites right now. And I tried to find an example and I could not find it. Uh, but we're seeing lots of customers coming in right now. And, and what they're saying is you're seeing spider webs on junipers, spruce, uh, uh, Spanish brooms. You'll see spider webs, but there's no spiders, just this light webbing. You don't see any insects. Go, what is that? And if you let that thing go, it'll cover up in webs and then it will start to look dusty. Just looks like it's off color a little bit. And then from there in about three weeks, it'll be dead. So you want it, it'll go from web it, webbed to dusty to dead like that. So you don't want to let it, spider mites go. And they, they seem to like the heat. Spider mites are a summer plant. That's also grasshoppers or a summer, a summer bug. Uh, blister beetles, these way, clouds of black beetles will fly around and they hover around the neighborhood and then they land on your mimosa tree and they strip every, every leaf off. So when you see that, you want to really grab on it. And so uh, go after them if you see that. So we haven't seen blister beetles yet. We're just starting to see grasshoppers. In my garden center, they're about not even a half inch long yet. Uh, and they're starting to cause, I've got some great examples. Thank you for bringing these. I've got some in my own gardens and some, they haven't quite wilted yet, but this is grasshopper damage. Just some of the foliage, they eat the soft tissue in the leaf. This is my uh, culinary sage. You've just seen holes disappearing. And I thought this was, skate, was a, a snail or slugs or something. I get down there and I've seen little tiny grasshoppers jumping around. Can you see that as well online? So little holes. This is a great example. This is like, you've got to get on this. <laughs> and then they were eating my mints, just starting. So you'll see, can you see that leaf kind of kind of disappearing? That's on mint. You wouldn't think they would eat mint, but they are. And so what I'm going to do this afternoon, uh, I was just going out getting examples for you all today. Uh, what I'm going to do this afternoon is I'm going to put down no-low bait around my gardens. So and, and what I'll do is, this, this is basically it's wheat and they've laced it with a virus that is deadly to grasshoppers, only grasshoppers, not to birds, not to dogs, not to husbands, not to gardeners, just, just to grasshoppers and, and crickets. Grasshoppers and crickets, those two things. And they're highly attracted to it. And so they're going, oh, free meal. This, this is my favorite meal. They go out and they eat it and then they, they get sick. They don't die immediately, it's not a poison. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a virus kind of thing, it's biological, and they'll just stop eating. So and then any egg that they laid afterwards will be infected with this virus, and then grasshoppers are cannibals. It's kind of grotesque, but 
when they finally do keel over dead in the garden, their buddies will come and eat it, and so the virus spreads through that colony. And it's a great way to keep, keep them from coming at you, especially you folks with the bigger properties. So for me, this is, this is a pound. This will cover an acre. I'm, a, I'm gardening. My house is on a half an acre. I'll, I'll take this and I'll put it on around the outer edge of my gardens. You don't want to put this in the gardens or the grasshoppers are attracted to it and they don't die immediately. You want to put it towards the outside of the garden so they're pulled out of the gardens. Then we'll eat it and get sick and go from there. I'll leave some in reserve so I can come back at it in about a month and I'll do it again. Again, this is a living, living product, so you want to check the date on it. So this just came in. Uh, we, we purposely have been waiting to bring this in so we had a fresh batch because it's, it's got a living, breathing thing. It doesn't winter over for you. If you're to wait and use the rest of this up next year, you'd just be feeding the grasshoppers and making them fat and full and encouraging them to grow, not, not infecting them with the virus. So no low bait's a great way to go, especially when you catch them early. If you catch them while they're large, let's say in another month, month and a half, like in August, the grasshoppers are this big and they're, you know, it takes a shotgun to take them down. Um, then it would infect them, it would actually affect their eggs, it would actually give you longevity for, for affecting that colony or that uh, group of grasshoppers. Um, but you're really affecting them for next year more than this year. I find that this does work for about a year, year and a half, about 18 months or so. So this will affect grasshoppers this year and a little bit next year, but eventually it starts to come back at you. But if your ladybugs or, or prey mantis or birds were to get into this, your dogs walk on it, it, it wouldn't affect them at all, uh, not, not one bit. So it just affects grasshoppers. So great way to go. Also. Another question people ask, it seems like, do I spread it like, like fertilizer, flakes around? I personally, uh, I've done it both ways, sprinkling it, and then I've, I prefer little piles, just like a tablespoon here around, so that uh, if we do get rain, it feels it's humid. It's like the humidity is higher than normal for June. Normally it's bone dry and windy. It's just humid. Well, if we get some rain or if you irrigate, or if the animals kind of run around, the schnauzers are playing around in it, and it, it just doesn't knock it, doesn't, it doesn't bury it as easily, so I can see it easier. So both ways work, okay? No bait. there you go. That's, it. That's the most effective thing you can do for grasshoppers right now. There's no better for longevity kind of stuff. The other one that I'm, I'm working with right now, and you know, Jeremy, I don't know that I have plant protector up here. I just treated my pine trees. Could you get me a bottle of plant protector? The pine trees are in such distress. I think that's worthy of, 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 of catching up. So your evergreens in your yard, you should be very worried. You should be very protective. You should really be pampering them because there's intense pressure on all the pines, spruce, firs, uh, all your evergreen things, uh, and I think, I haven't quite seen it yet, but the junipers I'm worried about, because I think the spider mites seem to go after junipers, but we've seen an incre definite increase in the number of bark beetles, or Ips beetle, they go by two names. Sometimes there's flathead borers, a little bit bigger thing. There's several things eating. Thank you, Jeremy, appreciate that. Here we go, we'll just show it to the folks online. So plant protector right there. Is that a good distance for oh, the yeah. camera? Okay, good. There. <laughs> plant protector is, uh, so I've got some pine trees, some, some pinion pines uh, in my own yard. They look a little stressed, so they're starting to weep a little bit from the trunks. You're seeing that. Sometimes you'll see a pinhole like in ponderosa pines. You'll see that big tr uh, bark flake. You'll just see a hole like someone took a pin and went dunk. That's the exit tunnel of bark beetle. And so underneath that bark, there's colonies, literally by the hundreds of the cutest little beetle. They're just tiny little things, little black things. And they just eat, they have a party underneath the bark of your pines until they girdle it and the tree dies. Once they girdle it, there's no recovery. There's just, it's just dead. There's just chainsaw stuff. And so for my own, for my own and my neighbors, you kind of want to be my neighbor. So I kind of, I help you take care of the strategic pines that are benefiting me and you both, I can, let me help you a little bit. And so I put the plant protector on. This is a systemic. Mix it up in a watering can or a five gallon bucket or something. Uh, and what you do is you measure around the circumference of the trunk or by height, depending on how small that plant is. With most trees, you're, you're measuring the circumference. 
And however many inches that is, that's how many ounces of this you need. So most of my trees are maybe eight, 12 inches, something like that. So I put a third of the bottle or something. Top off the rest with water and I'll pour it right at the crown, right at the trunk, right where the trunk meets the, the earth. That's where you put all of this. The plant will now absorb that underneath the bark. It goes up through the cambium layer, through, through the trunk, and it affects, it takes out the bark beetle. One application lasts for a year. I did this, I fertilized my pine trees. I did this last weekend with uh, all-purpose plant food. Best food ever for evergreens. And then what I did is I took my, uh, I don't put my natives on, on drip irrigation, uh, but I do care for them. And what I'm doing right now is I'm, I've got a little fan sprayer on the end of my hose, just this little tiny shoots up water. You can use a soaker hose or whatever. I happen to have a fan sprayer, a little metal cheesy thing. I throw it at the base of the tree and I run it for a couple hours, once a month. Don't overdo it with, with your conifers, your, your native stuff especially, or you could overwater them and kill them. But I think that's gonna really, my, my trees look pretty good, but I'm treating them with plant protector. I've fertilized them and I've watered them once a month since really the drought started since last year, I've just been watering them. But even my trees that I've cared for, they look stressed. I can see the bark beetles going after them. So it's just easy prey. What happens is I think Tree. So really be careful. If you've got a ponderosa or a pinion pine or any kind of evergreen, really take care of them because they're going to be under stress here. So uh, anyway, just that's, that's what we're going with that one. Okay, let me just go down the list because I brought in several examples. These are great examples of drought stress. This is a rosemary. It just kind of this, this damage probably happened two, three months ago before the irrigation came on, probably last winter, early spring. And now it started, it recovered, so I turned the irrigation on. This is from my own yard, I'm embarrassed to say. Uh, but started turning the irrigation, and now it's starting to flush new growth. So it'll recover just fine. I'll prune this out, it'll recover just fine. This is also drought stress. So you're seeing the brown needles just inside there. But... It, again, this looks like old damage. It's flushed. This is new spring growth right here, so it will recover. If you fertilize this and get it to grow some more, you'll never see this old damage. It was back here. Also, many of the conifers, see the brown leaves right there. Can you guys see that? Just so you can, so, so you don't feel left out. There you go. Uh, anyway, um, many of your pine trees, especially after they flush their new growth, that old growth that's closer to the trunk. So when they push that new growth, they also put another layer of wood on or more bark. So they naturally just shed needles on the inside of the trunk. It is not uncommon for evergreens to shed some needles. Don't be worried about that, especially if it's on the inside. Be really worried if it's at the top of the tree. It's turning yellow or brown at the tips. And towards the end, that tree is under tremendous stress and you should be worried with that. So we'll need to correct that. Come and talk to us. So that could be bark beetle, could be old drought damage, could be just need, we need to correct the watering. Could be a lot of different things, but watch for that. This does not concern me one bit. I think it's just old damage. Fertilize it and it'll come right out of it like it was nothing. Okay, there you go. We got grasshoppers all done. There we go. This I brought. This is Centranthus uh, right there. So... It's, uh, or Jupiter's beard, it's a wildflower. It's been in bloom for two months in my gardens and there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. It's just done blooming. What I'll do is I'll just cut it off, fertilize it and it'll go right back into bloom again. So it's just out of bloom. So deadhead or pinch the flowers off 
and many of these perennials will come right back into bloom for you. So we'll cover fertilizer in a second. So it's, it is time to feed everything in the yard before the rains come. Usually the rains come around July 4th. Typically the 100 year average monsoon starts in Arizona, June 15, usually down towards Tucson, that area, White Mountains first, and then it kind of comes this way. Uh, but usually by about July, July sometime we're getting humidity, cloud cover, which we've already had some of that. I thought it would have hit, hit already, but not quite. You can see the White Mountains being rained on now. So they've seen some moisture. So it'll just work its way over. We actually need the heat. We need it to be in the 90s to be able to draw. That seems to draw or suck that, that moisture into us. So it's kind of a symbiotic thing they do. So nothing wrong with that. This is a cool one. This is in, in my native oaks at home. Oops, there we go. Can you see this? It's called a gall. Can you see that? So here we can pass that around. That's basically what that is. Yeah. Um, there's an insect, little tiny beetle thing, that lays her egg on the tissue of, the, of the, the branch of that plant, and it mutates, causes a DNA change of the plant, so it starts to grow around the egg of that particular insect to protect it. So now it, there's nothing can get to it. You know, that her larva, will, her young, will mature inside that gall. And then I cut one open in the middle here. You'll see there's a little exit tunnel right there. So it burrowed its way back out. So you'll see inside. They're not hollow, typical galls. I guess there are. There's, there isn't a hollow orange gall. That is, it's a different kind of bug. Hard as a rock. And then it's just a bug. It's really, there's nothing you can do for this. It doesn't kill the tree. It just makes it, it's alarming. It's like a tumor, uh, but it doesn't hurt the tree at all. I don't really worry about them. I guess you could cut your way out of it, but just a lot of work for no real benefit. The bugs will still come back at you the next spring and do it again. So galls are very, very common on oak trees. Uh, some of the native kind of shrubbery uh, trees and stuff, galls are very, very common. Okay, G-A-L-L, gall. Ooh, what other death and decay do we have? Ah, oh, tomatoes. We are famous for, that's a tomato. I think that looks like a Roma. It's rotting on the very end. Can you see that? So this is called blossom mindrot. Very, very common. A lot of this is due because of our very high alkalinity in our, our water. And then when a plant is staying too wet, it seems to lock up a lot of the calcium that's in the soil, this is a calcium deficiency. So if you simply take your tomatoes and spritz them, what I'm doing that now with, with mine, called with uh, root yield booster, this is liquid calcium. You spritz the foliage, the plant, about every other week, you spritz your tomato plant, it will get rid of this blossom end rot. This is all because of calcium deficiencies on your tomatoes. If you see that, it could also affect, uh, I see if I've seen it on my peppers, Squash sometimes will, will start to form and it'll just turn yellow and fall off. That's a calcium deficiency. That's blossom end rot. So calcium makes this, calcium brings out the flavor, the size, and it prevents that from happening. We're not overwhelming you. That's good. Yeah. Dead twig on the top of a spruce tree. That's just old damage from last. Someone brought this in going, oh, it, the top died. What happened? This is called winter kill or winter burn, uh, sometimes it can happen to photinias, hedges, uh, pine trees. We saw it a lot this winter, and this is just drought. So we didn't have any moisture. We had one, one snow event, remember back in January? We had like uh, three foot of snow or so. Uh, talk about, wasn't fun to own a garden center back then. Think, think acres scraping off three foot of snow. There's just, oh, it's dying. Scraping snow in a blizzard. That, that moisture came at the wrong time. The plants could not take, they weren't actively taking in moisture. So it, we got moisture as though the plants got, received no moisture. So literally this spruce tree, it had budded up last year. You're seeing this is new, new growth. Then it got dry in the winter, got cold and died. So it did, just the tip died. So the rest of the tree looked fine. We told them to take the next strong branch, bend it up and that'll be the new lead on this. This you should water in the winter your plants here, because we're notorious for having long dry spells in winter. And so just a couple times a month, 
Turn the irrigation on by hand or water by hand if you need to, and that'll keep this from happening. If this had not dried out, if the moisture had been kept going, trees have uh, uh, naturally occurring antifreeze in them. And so as long as they're moist, that antifreeze can, can keep moving up and down the tree. But when it gets dry, it just sacrifices the tops and the tips. And it's just, I'm going to keep the core alive. If it gets dry enough, the plant can actually die. It's just winter kill. So nothing you can do about it. We told them just fertilize it, encourage it to grow, and take a bamboo stake and train the next longest branch to, to go up. And it'll just naturally take off for you. This... I don't know where we're getting all this. A customer brought this in. I wish you could see that a little bit better. This is powdery mildew. I don't even know if that picks up online. Can you see that? So this is a, a white coating. Can you see that? This is white powder. Look on it. This is powdery mildew. It's because it's been so dry. Well, it's been so humid, actually. I think this is on verbena. We've seen it on uh, coreopsis. Uh, we've seen it on uh, uh, spireas. Certain things, they seem to like the tender leaves. Photinia, so they've been very, very common on Photinia, yep. So here we would just spray this with Revitalize. Is There's a, I think I brought some of that. Do I have that? Orange label. Yeah, thank you. I knew, yeah, you're tuning in. You're teaching next week's class, right? Good deal. So Revitalize, this is a, this is a biological, again, we're into organics and biological controls as best we can. It's just safer for all of us. This, uh, you spray this and it just keeps the, the spore from spreading. And birds and insects spread this. So the light on one tree that's infected, and they'll just go down and jump on another plant. It just gets on their feet and just spreads, just rampantly. So you really want to keep on this. This will actually coat the entire plant with white. It'll look chalky, and then it will kill the plant. Uh, especially as we go into the monsoon season. July, August is typically wetter than normal. We need that. Well, this just goes crazy when you get a little afternoon rain, some humidity. This goes nuts. Really watch for that white powder and get on it right away. And I would spray this on it, revitalize every couple of weeks until you see the new growth coming out clean. And once the new growth comes out clean, you've pretty much licked the problem. So roses are notorious for powdery mildew, this white, white buildup. Oh, what else? Ah, oh, here we go. This is classic iron deficiency. So just yellow, the new growth is yellow. Only one thing causes that, iron. You wanna feed up some iron. So this is in our, um, in our trees over here. So I'm gonna clean them up. And I'm gonna give them some chelated iron. That'll green this up like immediately, just like that. And then I'll, then I'll fertilize it actually with the all-purpose food. I'm gonna do a do double dose. This will be the long growth, the, the all-purpose food, and this will be the I want it green like now because uh, this is embarrassing. It's just we've been watering so much right now to keep everything alive um, that it just flushed all the minerals, all the nutrients that were in the bucket, just flushed them out. Well, you see this classic on, on aspens, apples. A lot of things will show a little off color. That's almost, I, almost always iron in June and July because you've been watering to keep things that's been hot and dry. So you've been watering, so it's flushed those minerals out, those, that food you gave it last spring, that's all gone now. So now it's left with alkaline water, which is what you have coming out of your tap. And so it just turns yellow. So classic iron deficiency. All right. You all are just so good. I think I'm almost done here. This is a great example of rose, rosaria. Hey, Michelle, are you here? Oh, okay. Sometimes roses, especially on the inside of the, of, the, of the structure of the plant, gets yellow leaves like this. This is a fungal, it's a, it's a fungus basically that loves to eat roses. And so it's very, very easy to solve this. Again, revitalize, you spray that with that, with this again, that'll take out this, this yellowing leaves. This is, not on the, this is not on the new growth. This is on the inside of the old mature growth that happened first of spring uh, on roses. So just another bacteria. You've seen lots of leaf spots. My tomato plants, I'm not letting my tomatoes touch the ground. So I've got them all staked. Tomatoes want to die. They want disease, death, decay. They want to have curls and leaves. And they just, they're like this sugar making factory and things like to eat them. 
And so if the foliage touches the ground, lots of these uh, uh, leaf spots will jump from the soil onto the foliage. So I try to keep it aerated. I try to keep it up where, where air is going through it. I don't like my, my foliage to touch the ground. So that's why I'm using cages mainly. Sometimes I'll grow them over a, 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 my raised beds. I'll grow a tomato over the edge and grow like this. But then I've got all basically block. It doesn't touch the soil really. It's touching the, trying to get aeration. Sun is all really good. Okay. I think I've covered every, all the bug stuff. Just keep on it. What is this? Oh, that's another example. This is a customer brought this in yesterday. Grasshoppers, grasshoppers, grasshoppers. See the leaves just disappearing? Just holes showing up in the foliage? That's grasshopper. So it wouldn't be snail and slugs yet. Usually they show up later, August, September, July, August, September is when snail and slugs show up and you'll see holes missing. Right now it's grasshoppers. If you see leaves, parts of leaves missing, almost guaranteed a grasshopper. Okay, did we cover all the insects you're thinking about? Right now it's grasshoppers, powdery mildew, bark beetle, aphids and thrip are out thick. They've been out really thick right now. And really for those bugs, we're using triple action. Right now it's pretty easy to kill bugs. You can go all organic. This is neem oil, N-E-E-M, neem. Um, spritz that, this will take out powdery mildew, spider mites, aphids and thrip, anything small, small grasshoppers, things small. It's not, a, not, a, not as good at taking out big, like the ground is moving with grasshoppers, then we move on to stronger stuff, but we're early yet. So I always start with this because it's so safe. You can spray this up to the, to the day of harvest for apples, for, gra for cucumbers, for tomatoes, peppers, this is very, very safe. I mean, use some common sense. Don't, don't spray it in the dog bowl and stuff. But you can, if you wash the fruits, you can use it right away. So this is where I always go first line defense for especially now because things are so small. As we progress, we'll move up to like chemicals, the hardcore stuff. So, but I try not to do that now. The other one that we're seeing right now are, are caterpillars. You're seeing budworms on geraniums and petunias and calipricoas, or million bells. There's a little tiny cute green caterpillar and they like to eat nothing but flowers. They just love flowers. And as they eat your petunia, let's say purple petunia, they start to turn purple. As they eat your pink petunias, they start to turn pink. So they take on the color, whatever their flower they're eating. So if you've got this beautiful flower and no flowers, this beautiful green, it looks healthy, but no flowers, almost guaranteed budworm. We're starting to see a lot of customers coming in with that. That, and there's a caterpillar up into the trees. They're into purple leaf plums, the oaks, uh, pin oaks, and emery oaks. You'll see this web, it looks like a football, about, the size, about this big. And there'll be a caterpillar about an inch and a half, two inches long. They come out and they strip the foliage off, off the tree. It's very, very common. You're seeing a lot of samples of that right now. Uh, those are tent caterpillars, very easy to kill. I'll show you in just a second. And then there's, I haven't quite seen it yet, but you will see it pretty shortly. There'll be a huge green caterpillar that eats your tomatoes and peppers. It's called a tomato worm. So it gets about four or five inches long. It's huge, very easy to kill. And what you're using is BT. Do I have that? Thoroughside. I've got it ready to use BT or Thoroughside, the same exact chemical, same exact organic. Uh, this only goes after caterpillars, highly effective for caterpillars and completely organic. So the, uh, so say it's a tent caterpillar on a tree, you spray the foliage, they'll come out of that tent, out of that webbing in the evening and eat the foliage. They'll take some of the foliage with this, they'll get sick, they'll go back into the nest and not come out again. It's very gratifying. So your, to your uh, uh, tomato worms, they come out, eat your tomatoes. You can just throw that on the ground. You don't have to keep, let me have that thing. Pass that thing up front, that gall. What is that? That's just, it looks unnatural. <laughs> Sitting there with this gall. You could almost take, make a club out of that thing. So that thing is huge. Look at that. I wonder if there's, here, I'll show you my, uh, my new uh, pruners here. 
Oh my gosh, this is like magic. This will take a finger off in a heartbeat. Let's just see if it'll cut that in two. Yeah, you can see it's not OSHA approved. Yeah, here you're seeing an exit tunnel right there. It came out. You're seeing the holes right there, but when you look inside of it, you're seeing the exit tunnel right there. So the insect, this has already been, this is probably laid last year. Here, I'll pass it around. You kind of see there's an exit tunnel right there. There's a couple of them, actually. There probably were two or three insects inside of that. They matured inside that gall, and then they burrow it out, and then they go and lay more eggs, which creates more galls on your oak trees. They seem to, oak, oaks and hackberries, the native oaks and hackberries, that seem to be what they go after. Where was I at? Worms BT. Yeah, worms BT. You spray this on the foliage. We have what? Yeah, BT. Yeah, these two are the same thing. If you have a small plant, do this, or a tomato plant, do this. If you got a big tree, do this. So that's how you kill caterpillars organically. This does not affect aphids, does not affect thrips, does not affect grasshoppers, only caterpillars. But highly, highly effective and very safe, especially if you've got dogs and that kind of stuff. All right, let's go over food. You really need to fertilize everything in the yard. In fact, let's do this. I've got five copies, four copies. I gave you one. So who wants a cup? Who's new? Who's This is your first class. This is your very first class? Really? Here. I know nothing. Oh, well, here you go. Very first class. Welcome to Waters. Here, and then I've got a water guide. Now, you all will get, you'll get a copy of this. Just <laughs> hold on with me. Was there someone new over here? Water, this is how you water things. So... That's kind of the water guide. In fact, who wants who wants a water guide? Water guide? Are we all watering in the back? You you can only get one, so you. I'll have to. There you go, and pass one right behind her too, so she's I'll kind of share it that way. You want one of those too? There you go. Now, what I'll do for the rest of you. Um, that was kind of a tease. Shoot shoot me your email, and I'll email the PDF of each of both of those to you. So if you didn't get the water guide, it'll be, you'll get a copy of that in your email probably by the end of the day. So give, give me, put your email on there and I'll make sure you all get a copy of both of those by the end of the day. Fertilizing, one of those is on fertilizing and then we'll cover on watering and then we'll probably be about on time. I'll show you a couple of plants. So we're kind of, we're towards the, up, the back half of this thing, okay? So food. The food, you should fertilize at least three times a year. Really, I fertilize four times a year. If you're thinking holidays, think Easter, 4th of July. We're taking advantage of the summer rain. That'll, you can get a whole other set of growth by, by fertilizing the summer. The most important feeding of the entire year, bar none, Halloween. Fall feeding really keeps plants healthy. My evergreens, I fertilize them at the new year because they tend to go yellow on me in midwinter. So it's called winter chlorosis. If you just hit them with a little bit of food right at that New Year's, it keeps them just green as can be. So Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, New Year's. You're coming up. You want to fertilize everything in the landscape before the 4th of July. You want to have that food out there waiting. I'll show you what to use here in a second. So when the rains come, you can take advantage of that, that afternoon rain. So we need, we need moisture. Uh, and I, it looks like we're going to get it. Uh, and having Mother Nature activate that, that food for you and, and get it to the plants be a game changer. Right now, your plants are very dependent on you for, for food and water. Uh, we, we, the drought is causing some serious stress in the landscape, and so they're very dependent. So I'm, I'm, te I'm teaching folks, you need to really go walk the drip line and make sure that it's tuned up correctly. Make sure you got enough emitters. Make sure your plants, because they're very dependent on you, for that, that amount of water through your drip irrigation or however you're watering, okay? So for me, I had a water break last weekend, last Sunday. I had a water break, just my main front front uh, water ba uh, flower baskets. Uh, a tea had failed. So it just came out, now it's just half inch line. It's a lot of water just flowing out there underneath. The maple tree underneath the break was really, really happy, but my flowers weren't so happy. So you just, you, just, you walk the line, you just, you made sure that it was working okay. Easy fix, cost me $1.99 and you know, 
15 minutes to pull out the rock and put it put it together. And it was all fixed. Really, really be careful right now. Watch after your plants. So I'm fertilizing everything right now with oops, all-purpose plant food. Uh, this is cottonseed meal and bird guano and iron. It's got three and sulfur and some fairy dust. It's something we make in the back. We, we make this for, for local gardens. It's a recipe I've been perfecting for 20 years. It really, really, really works. Uh, but you really want to get it on to get it on the rock. And when the rains come, it'll float through the fabrics. It'll get down through the roots. It'll, it'll get to the roots. So just get it on there. So when we do get the rains, it activates. You want to focus on the drip line. Don't focus on the trunk. So if you get a, a larger, uh, um, if you get a larger, get a sip of water here, larger tree. So let's say I'm the, tr this is the trunk. The outer branches are like this. This is called the drip line. You want to focus on the outer branches, kind of halfway out from the trunk to the outer tips. That's where all the feeder roots are, all the delicate, light, real light white hairs. That's what picks up water and that's what picks up food. Focus on, focus the food out there and you'll get better uptake. Towards the trunk, right there at the base of a larger tree especially, those are just big, barky anchoring roots. They're very large. Got, they've got bark on them. They can't really absorb food and water very much. They just keep the tree upright. Big shrubs, they just keep it up straight. You want to focus on the drip line, the outer edges. Same with your water. You want to focus out there, not at the trunk. Okay, so sometimes you need to upgrade or modify or tune up your irrigation so as the plant grows, we can add another emitter or bring it out further out where the plant can, can take up the water. Say so anything stressed, I'm adding this at the same time as my food. I put humic. This is humic acid. Humic acid does two things. If you take a... Can you see that on the camera okay? I'm trying not to forget you all, but you really should be here and visit and say hi. Say you tuned in, saw, saw, the, uh, saw the class. How many people are tuned in? How many are? Uh, 16. 16, very good, glad all 16 you're here. You double the class size, well done. Humac is, is uh, if you take a compost pile and you boil it down to its last elements, what you get is humic acid. That's what this is. And it, it feeds the worms, it feeds the soils, what this does. So the plants go, oh, the soil's alive. Oh, what's going on here? I should root. And it kind of tickles the feet so it wants to root more. So if you've got anything stressed out, encourage more roots, and that'll, that'll get that plant to come out of stress. So any kind of yellowing, any kind of wilting, any kind of, any kind of stress you see on that plant, give it this with the all-purpose plant food at the same time. So this is granular. Just sprinkle it out there. You know, go through the rock, it'll go through the fabric, it'll go through the yard. Just mainly get it out there. You do not need to work these things in. So for gardeners, you gardeners, I can't tell you, you gardeners just like to work. So you're allowed to go rake and till and make, turn it in. But for me, I just chuck and go. And I expect rain to kind of take it into the rocks and stuff. So, okay, these two things are what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so so for you folks online or over here, he had voles, right? So little field mice, they were really bad this, this last spring. They were really bad. I had some damage to things. So little tiny field mice. It basically looks like a house mouse with a real pointy nose. But they love eating the roots off your plants, and so they'll just eat the plant. So his question was, could I put humic on to help it, to encourage it to root more? Absolutely, yes, that's, that's, that's the ticket. So fertilize and... Do them both at the same time. And it's acid, so it makes, makes the soil, it lowers the pH, it makes it more acidic. So you're always trying to make your gardens more acidic here because our water is so alkaline. So you're always trying to counteract that water, counteract the water, bring that pH down. So, so kind of tune out the HGTVs, the Fine Garden magazines, where they're saying, oh, you want to add lime to your soil, want to sweeten the soil. Never sweet your soil here or you'll kill things. So that's, that's everywhere in the country is very acidic. They've got problems with acidy kind of water and soils. They always want to raise the pH, not here in the Southwest. Here we're always trying to do the opposite, lower the pH, lower the pH. And that's partly why our fertilizer works so well. I think three or four, maybe 5% is sulfur in that. 
So it automatically trying to, it, that lowers the pH. Soil sulfur lowers, makes things more acidic. That's kind of why it works. Okay, so fertilize now. You got some time. Just fertilize before the rains come. Usually that's the first part of July. So you get now through the end of the end of the month, really. Fertilize everything in the yard. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, her question was, what do I do about my fruit trees? Were you just here in the class? Do what I just told you to do. Shade trees. Do what I just told you to do. Everything in the yard. Everything. Butterfly bush, shade trees. The only difference would be possibly we do make a fruit tree food. This is a vegetable and fruit tree food. Um, this is an organic food we put together. And calcium, we know we're going to see that calc blossom end rot. Do I still have that sample? Anyway, that tomato with the bl blossom with the rotted end, that's such a common problem. So we made a food that's 7% that's calcium. So it also brings out the flavor of apples and peaches and cherries. It brings out calcium, makes everything sweeter, tastes better, fragrance. So we made a fertilizer for that. So if you have a lot of edibles, grapes, berries, pomegranates, figs, this is a preferred food for those things. That's the only real difference. And I would still put the humec on. Anything stressed. If, if in doubt, humic, humic really brings things around, greens them up kind of stuff. So shade trees, specifically to your point, is going to prefer this. Shade trees are going to prefer this. Evergreen is going to prefer this. Okay. In addition, before the rains come, just to save, your, save some problems, uh, as soon as that first rain comes, the weeds go from, tumbleweed go from, oh, isn't it so cute, to it's the size of a VW beetle, just like that. Uh, the goat head goes from this little tiny cute little plant to, it's this big around and covered with those little thorned seed heads that you that, like your dog step on and go, oh, it hurts. Uh, those are all annuals. They all love the summer heat and they all come back by seed. Kill the seed. Don't let the seed get ahead of you. This is weed and grass stopper. While I'm fertilizing in June, I also break it while I got my hand spreader out. I'm putting this down. This keeps the seed from germinating. It doesn't allow the seed to come back at you. So I'll put this in between my roses. I'll put it over the rock lawn where I tend to have a lot of weeds. I put this down because I hate weeding. So this will keep the seed from germinating as it puts a taproot down. It doesn't let the taproot get down in the soil. So it really cuts down on the weeding in your yard. It's, it's a game changer. So weed and grass topper. And now's your time. Now, let's see. Doing, got 15 minutes. I think we're doing good. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, phosphorus. Can I go that far? Where was the phosphorus? Do I have that someplace right here? So what I use this for, so I love flowers. Flowers, are, that's kind of my, I'm a flower gardener. I love flowers. From, as you drive by my house, as you come down the driveway, containers everywhere, there's just flowers everywhere. Butterfly bush, lots of sages, lots of uh, Russian sage, autumn sage, or salvia gregii. Lots of things in bloom right now. And so what I'll do is about... Once a month, every six weeks, no more than every other week, other every other month. I mean, I'm chucking a handful of this on my shrubs, especially. And this is 0180, zero nitrogen phosphorus potash. The middle number causes roots, fruits, and flowers. If you want more flowers on your plants, give it some superphosphate. Superphosphate, if you think of it in terms of humans, this is kind of like a Snickers bar. Want to give it just a real quick snack and get it to bloom like just just to go and go, oh, this is great. Oh, man, I want some more of that. Let's go, go, go. Let's bloom, bloom, bloom. Super phosphate. So the uh, uh, 744 all-purpose plant food that I showed you, that's a balanced fertilizer. That's great for just everything from shade trees to fruit trees to lawns to perennials. Just fertilize everything. But if you really want to bring that flower out and make it like glow, at, glow in the dark, super phosphate brings out that color. And then this, you get different takes on the internet. Just a sec. Um, you do not need to work this in. Some folks who you need to make, you need to dance underneath the full moon and, you know, wear a ball cap backwards, sideways, and 
uh, only wear one boot to, and work it in the ground to make this work. Just chuck it on the ground if it works. I'm telling you, just, you don't need to make this a lot of work. It's consistency. Also, if you had a lilac, uh, a, a rose, something that bloomed in the past but really didn't do very well today, this year, it's phosphorus. It ran out of phosphorus. Give it more phosphorus. I would do it. I would do this four times a year for a lilac that just stopped blooming, a wisteria that just didn't bloom like it has in the past. This needs more of this consistently, especially in the fall of the year. So fall, October. So that's how I use superphosphate. Hold on, in the back. How does that compare with your flower power? So flower power and this. How does it compare? Flower power. And I wasn't going to go, so I kind of covered so many technical things. I just kind of trying to keep it simpler so you don't glaze over on me. But you all are engaged. Are you still with me? Don't go anywhere. I know the coffee cup's out. The refrigerator's calling. But you should come to the garden center. How's that look on camera? Does it look okay? Yeah, okay, good. wish I could see myself sometimes. My mother gave me a Mr. Microphone as a kid. I've loved a microphone ever since. Something about it. So flower power, going back. Sorry, having fun with the folks online. Flower power, so if you're a garden center, you have to sell miracle Grow. That's it. It's the number one selling product, any garden product ever. It outsells petunias. The problem is I was selling cases and cases of miracle Grow, and my, my customers were killing their plants with miracle Grow. It's a salt-based fertilizer. It works with our water and just obliterates, makes things go yellow. This white buildup comes out of containers. It's just, it's a bad product for the Southwest. So I stopped selling it. That's dangerous. You need to have a water soluble food. Um, so we made flower power. This is not, this is made to work with our water, with our environment. It's a balanced food. So this is 10, no, 12, 48, eight. So it's a full balance. It's got iron, boron, magnesium. It's got a full balanced food and it's water soluble, like a miracle Grow. It's got a scoop in it, you add it to your watering can, a scoop per gallon, you water things in a couple times a month, and they just bloom like crazy. So if the budworms took out your flowers, you know, remember that caterpillar that eats just flowers? That's budworm. If your plants stopped blooming because the caterpillars ate all your flowers, spray the, the uh, caterpillars with BT, this stuff, takes out the caterpillars, fertilize it with flower power, it'll be in bloom within a week. Week, 10 days, right back into bloom. This is as high of, this is basically liquid phosphorus. Is going back to your point, this takes quite a while to break down. This is available like this afternoon, right now. And that's really the difference. I use this mainly on my container gardens. I've got over 50 pots, lots of raised beds. Um, I'll, I'll use this mainly. This I use mainly on my flowering trees and shrubs. Butterfly bush, lilacs, uh, forsythias, the bigger things. Uh, so that's kind of how I use the two of them. Did I answer that okay? Got it. Thank you. Great, great question. Yes? Uh, I have uh, large uh, tomato plants in a pot. Yeah. Okay. This would make it flower like crazy. Okay. It'll make it flower like just and, and like right now. Yeah, raised bed. Actually, if I'm having a party, I mean, I've got the family over 4th of July. Kind of here's the insider secrets at the Lane Casa. So uh, the weekend before, maybe two weekends before, I'll go deadhead everything because I want it to look good. I want you to come over going, wow, this guy might own a garden center. My goodness. Wow, look at this place. Wow. Look at all the hummingbirds, the butterflies. Oh, my gosh. You're everywhere. I'll clean everything up. The weekend prior to the party, I give it everything this. And the following weekend, it is like, whoa, it's just magic. It's just beautiful flowers, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, it's, so you can actually force things to bloom and, and to look better. A little bit of care, just touching on them and then fertilizing with stuff. So this is more of a, a short-term fix. Again, again, you're using this every other week, a couple times a month, to really make it work. The, the meat and potatoes of things, if you had to choose between one or the other, go with this one especially for trees and shrubs, evergreens, go with this one. You got lots of flowers, tomatoes, uh, cute container stuff, hanging baskets, this is better. So that's, you use them in different ways. But great, great questions, good. Great questions. Let's cover a couple plants, because I got, I got nine minutes, if you wanted to go an hour, 
Otherwise, the seats start to get a little hard, and I realize that. So the monarchs, the butterflies are in trouble, monarchs specifically. A lot of their vegetation, the drought has really affected their habitats. So the local uh, butterfly or, or, or milkweed we have down in the lower greenhouse is perennial, comes back year after year, but it's kind of ugly. It's just a green, big, big green thing. Monarchs also like the tropical varieties. They're very used to this. And now you can have a milkweed that's actually pretty. So we've got an orange one, yellow, a blended one. So lots of milkweeds and it does actually help butterflies. It's just pretty, just a pretty plant. Clematis, take a look at that. Is that pretty? Oh my gosh. Secret with clematis, when you're, when you're growing this, this, this naturally grows here really well. The secret with growing great clematis, make sure the roots are well, are in the shade or well insulated, you know, shredded bark or something, and then have the tops grow up in the sun. And that's the magic, that's the magic place for clematis. You can count on them, perennial. Every year they're gonna bloom like this. So I like to plant these often with other plants. Let's say honeysuckle or Virginia creeper, uh, our native Virginia creeper. Doesn't really have a flower, it's just a big green mat. You plant this with a Virginia creeper, all of a sudden you get flowers coming through. You get two vines that kind of symbiotically work with each other. Now you got flowers coming through, uh, through your other vines. Butterflies love Pinta. This is an annual. Uh, this comes in pink, red, white, obviously. A lot of different colors. This is like a butterfly landing pad. In the mornings, butterflies are all over these. It doesn't smell. I don't know. So I just like that one. Full sun, blistering hot sun. It goes with these. These are all three hot sun annuals. This is Angelonica. Um, it just does this. It's kind of like a summer snapdragon, really, if you think about it. Snapdragons are done blooming. Uh, they're just kind of, they got spent flower heads. If you were to cut that flower head off and fertilize them, they'd go back into bloom here. As soon as the rains come, they'll start to bloom again. This one just loves, loves the heat. Comes in white, pink, red, purple, obviously. Uh, this is uh, Salonia. It looks delicate, but this loves blistering hot, crazy heat, reflective heat, blooms like crazy. And look, they go together. They're just pretty in the same pot. So this is firecracker or kufia. Hummingbirds love this plant. It's red. It's got tubular shaped flowers and it just loves the heat. Just, just, it's an annual that loves the sun, loves the summer, loves everything about this time forward through this will bloom until sometime in November. Then it just kind of collapses in, in the frost and then it's done. Unless you take cheat and go down to Phoenix and give it to a friend and go, here, why don't you keep it growing down there? Some perennials. So perennials, remember, come back. So perennial and permanent, we'll, we'll start with P. So perennials come back. This is a, a new variety of yarrow. Yarrow actually is a native, but you've never seen this color. This is called Dark Eyes Desert Eve Terracotta. Uh, yarrow, so it's tough. It's going to take our heat. Uh, the native one is just yellow. So if you see it with gray foliage, it's unusual to see this paprika kind of desert terracotta color. This is a new color of echinacea. It's called delicious candy. Now most most echinaceas are kind of like yellow or orange, but we're trying to introduce more varieties. Butterflies and birds both love this. What I do with my echinaceas is when they're done blooming, I'll pinch them off and they'll come right back into bloom. They'll keep sending off flowers as long as you pinch deadhead them. I'll do that until about September. Then I'll stop deadheading and I'll let them all go to seed and then they'll spread throughout the yard or they're a food source for my smaller birds that winter with me. They love echinacea as a food source. The, your seed lovers will do that. But echinacea, there's a lot of colors down there. Just a brand, I know I was dealing with gardeners. Yeah, VIP, virtual in person, not just virtual online. You come see us. Oh, also, hey, while you're on there, if you could do me a favor, if you could like it, it makes Google and Facebook like see us better, like we're small. And then if you could give us a like a five-star, not a four-star, five-star rating, 
makes Google see us better. It's kind of hard to compete with Depot and Lowe's and their million dollar ad budget, but we're trying our best. So anyway, uh, those are two perennials. This is funky. This is blue grama. Is that right? Blonde ambition uh, grass. It's a native. It grows wild out in the fields. This particular variety, look at the seed head, how it floats kind of sideways. It's just cool. True, true, true native. I mean, just get it started. It'll go by itself. Um, if, you, if you water it, put it on a drip system and treat it like a tree or a shrub, it'll keep this blossom on there for a long time. But great little easy care grass. Not meant to mow. It's meant to be an ornamental kind of grass. So I grow this one in a big uh, blue, cobalt blue vase. It's about this tall. And then it comes out the neck. It kind of just has this wavy grass. It's just, it's just magic. So fun, fun grass. Two of my favorite blues. This, I believe, is a new variety. Yeah, crazy blue. This is crazy blue uh, Russian sage. Now, Russian sage is very common. It's a weed here. Gets up about this tall. Spiky blue shrub. Um, it can be kind of weedy. It seeds up. It kind of runs and comes up everywhere. This is a dwarfed variety, and it's a bluer variety. So it's, it only gets up about that tall. So instead of this, so it's a third the size. It's got a deeper, richer color and less problematic as far as weediness, seediness coming up and being mischievous, okay? This is one that's similar. This is called cat mint. Cat mint turns into a, gets about 18 inches and in kind of ball shaped like this. And uh, animals will not eat either one of these. Deer, rabbit, javelina, do not eat these. They don't like the smell, the taste. But butterflies, the pollinators, love both of them. So this one I tend to, it's mine is in full bloom right now at home. It's a big boy. Just, it's got to be this big, just fully matured. Um, I hardly care for it, but it'll bloom for about a month and a half, maybe two months, and then I'll cut it back, shave all the spent flowers off, fertilize it, go right back into bloom, just like that. So it's really a good plant. Both are really good, tough, drought-hardy, native kind of plants for here. This is one you probably don't know about. This is, what's the name, specific name? Hyssop. Red Star Hyssop. So this is a very neat, tidy, easy to care for shrub. This is fully mature. It'll get a little bit wider, kind of come out like this. But it just loves the blooming in the summer. It's got a real waxy, thick leaf to it. So it makes it very drought hardy. And then these little seeds, these little flowers turn into these little seeds that turn kind of orange through the fall. Real bright, very pretty. It's almost prettier in the fall than it is in the, in the uh, um, summer when it's in full bloom. So hyssop. Comes in several different colors down there. Just a funky plant you don't usually see. You only see it in the summer is when you'll see it at the garden centers. Same with this one. Ah, get those out of there. Anyone know what this is, you folks from the south? Crepe myrtle, that's right. Crepe myrtles love the sun. Sun. They love the heat. They love reflective heat. They like just all day from morning till noon till evening till if, they, if it was light out at midnight, it would be really happy with that. So it blooms like this. It's glow in the dark, fluorescent, purples, reds, pinks, whites. Uh, nothing's quite like a crepe myrtle as far as a, shr a summer shrub goes. Uh, this one does not like the spring. So it's typically shrub, it's a, per, it's a deciduous type of shrub. Doesn't have foliage in the winter. And so you'd swear the thing is dead until about May, Mother's Day, when it finally would get past the frost, starts a, starts a leaf out. And then when it starts to take off and that soil's warm enough, it just goes, just grows like crazy. So mine is just about to go into bloom. It's not quite like this yet at home, but it's close to it. Also, we don't grow crepe myrtle trees here. Only crepe myrtle shrubs, typically. So you don't see a lot of crepe myrtle trees. I wish. I've tried. But we get a cold. About every 10 years, winter goes really cold. It seems to reset them back to the ground, and they have to come back fresh from the ground. They go perennial on us. So they seem to reset, so they always come back as shrubs. Same with figs. You don't see fig trees here. You see fig shrubs and they're loaded with figs right now. 
So that because of that winter reset. And that's all I had for you. So I'm, I'm exactly one hour and one minute. Very good. I'll take questions if I didn't happen to get things for you. And I'll hang anything online. Oh, you folks online, you're so needy. Love you. All right, first question. What is and how to get rid of white buffs on my rosemary and lavender? When I pour water on it, they kind of disappear and melt, but they always come back. White buffs on my rosemary and Bugs? Buffs. B-U-F-F. Buffs. B-U-F. What's a white buff? What is a buff? You want to know what a buff is? Maybe, maybe we should make white bugs. Bugs, I think so. It sounds like white fly. White fly can 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 get onto things. Usually it's a little bit early for white fly, but it could be. I don't know where you're tuned in from. White fly are very easy to care for. Just spray it with this, and they'll stop coming back on your plant after you water them. So just water the plant, spritz it with the triple action, and take care of white fly. Alrighty. So any kind of white, little white things. Uh, my nectarine tree is producing fruit for the first time. Awesome. It looks like it's... Secreting, oh, uh, secreting yeah. Sap. Oh, yeah. Secreting sap. Not every uh, single one looks so destroyed and ugly. Not sure why. Yeah. So sap. That's a good one, actually. We've seen a lot of that. Whoa. Shouldn't have put those bags there. So, uh, thrip, also called noceums. Sometimes they can bite you and leave a little welt. So, thrip were really bad. They're not so bad now, but they were bad when that fruit was smaller. They have a scarifying mouth part, they have a, a scraping kind of mouth part. So they'll go in when that fruit is real small. They'll go and scrape some of that tissue off. And so it, as, the, as the fruit matures, even though that insect's no longer there, they did the damage earlier or scarred it. So you're seeing it show up on your nectarines later. So next year, if you get nectarines, go ahead and spray it early uh, when the fruits are small with the uh, triple action or, or a horticultural oil. Either one, that'll tend to repel. Uh, triple action has kind of a repelling action to it. It'll help keep those frip off of your nectarines. That's what's going on. Yep. Sure. Yeah, how often do you water Russian sage if it's in the ground? So Russian sage, this boy here, here's what I do with mine. So I, I'm a gardener. I want to care for plants. I like caring for plants. It makes me feel good. I run a drip emitter to my Russian sage for one year. After that... I bend back the irrigation, and I don't let it water. I just tape it off, and don't, I just plug it. And I, you'll never have to water that again. There you go. If you overwater Russian sage, it tends to grow up and flop over in a drunken stupor. It just doesn't, it does better going dry than going wet. Just water it for the first year, about once a week. And after that, don't water it again. It's that tough. Yeah. So that'll be the secret to a really denser, fuller, prettier Russian sage. If you put, if you water it too much, it gets too leggy, it gets too wide, too separated, and then it just kind of flops over and separates and does some weird stuff. So yeah, that water guide I gave you, or that you're going to have here shortly, if you put your email on that, your uh, email on that list, you have that water guide. Water it like that for the first year, and after that, don't water it again. Yes. Anything else online? Humic for pines. Humic. Yeah, absolutely for pines. Anything stressed, and pines are stressed, absolutely. Feeds the soil, so the mycorrhizal colonies, the worms, start to become more active. And when the plants see that soil become more active, they're going, oh, this is good stuff. I should root out more. It actually encourages deeper roots on your plants, especially when they're dried. Uh, they got too wet, got root rot. They got too dry, dry rot. It's going to help them to reroot. Yes. Something else back over here? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Good. Really? How interesting. So she has a rose garden, eight by eight, and they all cross pollinate each other and became a classic red. They're all the same color. Is that what's going on? The same size. So it sounds like you have shrub roses. Shrub roses can pollinate each other to do that. So really what I would do for you all, you might want to take one of those out a year or so and put it a hybrid tea or a floribunda, a named variety, not a shrub rose. So they'll stay more true to their 
to their, to their flower color. Shrub roses can sometimes cross pollinate each other, so they become a monotone, same color. Sounds like you've got shrub roses. So go with, go with a hybrid variety. You won't have it cross pollinate like that. So that's, that's what's going on. That's actually really unusual. That's kind of neat, actually. I don't get to see unusual very often. What else? Anything else online? I think that white pup she was talking about was a mildew. Oh, mildew. Yeah, Mildew's yeah. bad. Got it. Yeah, powdery mildew. That one's easy. Treat it with this. Powdery mildew. Treat it every couple of weeks until you see the new growth coming out clean. Should be should eliminate all your problems. And we're here at Waters Garden Center to eliminate all your problems. <laughs> there you go. Remember, write a review, Google your small business. People actually check reviews before they come shop you. It's just really helpful. And if you're a nurse or an accountant and you, or you just want an engineer, no one ever truly measures up. Don't leave a review. Just five star or no star. Just five is what it takes to be a rock star with Google. And then, and then what Google does is they go, oh, they got to be important. So people are talking about them. So they put you to the top. It's like it's like a game they're they're playing with us. So anyway, we'd be grateful for that. If you're tuning in online through Facebook, remember to make a comment. That helps us as well. Or like or subscribe helps us as well. So with that, I'll hang out I'll, as long as you want. Answer questions, or I'll just be hanging out all day. Actually, I'll be pruning trees after this. Thanks for coming in. Next week we've got, I think Michelle is teaching that on the perennials, heat loving flowers or something like that. So tune in through watersgardencenter.com under classes. Thanks for tuning in, folks. I'll let you go. Yeah, plant protector. Oh, sure. That's a good question, actually. Yeah, that's a really good. Could you do this, this, and this all at the same time? Yes. <coughs> this, this is going out where the roots are. This is actually protecting, it's like an inoculant or vaccine for trees. So it totally works, totally different. Now, yep, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I really was focused on evergreens or things I've had problems with. So I did my junipers last weekend because I know I get spider mites every year. I just get them. I just like them. I don't know why. They just do. So I, I, as a preventative, my, my the native pines have all gotten that like a month ago.